welcome to Behind the Sounds. I'm your host, Leah, and today I'm joined by an incredible songwriter and artist who is coming over to the UK in just a few weeks. Uh, please welcome Sycamore at Behind the Sounds. How are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, very, very well, thank you. Um, I know you have been a very, very busy bee. Um, got lots on at the moment. How are things? How's the music? Being back out, kind of playing shows again. Everything has been going well. Um, I'm actually coming to you from a hotel room in Canada, which is, well, I'm from Western Canada, but we're actually on a radio tour right now. So we're kind of in the middle of nowhere in a, a province called Saskatchewan. And um, it's it's like, it's good. It feels really good to be busy again and playing shows and, and actually meeting people in person as much as we can. And um, in the wake of my album that I dropped kind of later last year, uh, it feels really good to be able to feel somewhat normal again. So it's, it's it, you know, being busy just feels good now, honestly. It is, it's kind of weird. It's been such a shift, hasn't it? And it kind of went from being really full on to really, really quiet. And then we had that weird phase of time where everyone was kind of getting back to normal and now it's like full on again. How have you found kind of the change from being back out on the road now to kind of pre-pandemic? feel the change in myself a little more. I think that I'm like still getting used to things kind of being mostly pre-pandemic back to normal because I still have, like I put on a lot of hand sanitizer now, like, and I never used to do that. I feel like I'm a lot more conscious about like washing my hands or putting hand sanitizer on. But um, thankfully I feel a little more like the, the changes have happened more in me than they have like, as far as being on the road and everything else, that feels pretty, pretty similar to what it used to which is what we all hoped for right um but yeah like I said I just I'm just grateful to be out at all honestly so <laughs> navigating all the changes and figuring out just uh, what to do now that we're kind of caught up again is is fine with me yeah I love that and um, so we will talk about the album and the tour and lots of things but I love to kind of start at the beginning um I, I kind of your story is a really interesting one from kind of how you got into music but going back to your childhood did you always kind of have music in your life what was it like when you were younger I did um sort of I feel a little like I had to fight for it um in terms of not just listening to like country radio was the first music I ever remember hearing because my parents were rodeo athletes and uh we did a lot of traveling with them and and that's pretty much all you hear at rodeos is uh country music but um I was just very interested in it from an early age I guess and I at any point anytime there was music to listen to or albums to collect I was just down there trying to I remember actually being really young and like saving my money and uh you know waiting we grew up in the country and so waiting for a chance to go to the city and go to the record store and buy the one record that I had been wanting to buy for like two months and and getting it and then just just listening it till it till the wheels fell off so I have always been just a big appreciator of music and I think it's sort of just having all of that consumption eventually I wanted to start making my own music and so um yeah my childhood was a lot of I got a lot of opportunities to sing when I was younger just through uh school and through church and that sort of gave me a bit of a base level of confidence I suppose and then kind of right around college was when I I, I started a band with my best friend and we started kind of dreaming big for for making it an actual career and it's gone through a couple different um uh, I guess reincarnations <laughs> over the years and it's kind of settled on this project which feels really good and so yeah like music was um just always around you know I went to church growing up and, and obviously there's a lot of music in that that arena and so yeah I just feel really blessed that it's always just been kind of within reach you know. Mm -hmm. I love that and kind of going back obviously say country was a massive influence being around them environments are there any kind of particular artists or people that you're you're like you when you think about your childhood you're like yeah they were on the record player they were on the right they were the people you listened to is there anyone you look back on and you're like yeah it was them. Definitely. Um, Shania Twain was was the first concert I ever went to and she was mine and my sister's favorite artist for a really long time. And so and her being Canadian, she's you know, there's so many layers to the reasons why I appreciate her. You know, she's just a really good artist, a 
brilliant songwriter, but she's also been such a role model for me being a Canadian, being a woman, trying to break into this sort of crossover country pop uh, audience and into that world. So she's definitely a big one. Also, you know, George Strait is one of my dad's favorite artists and we heard him all the time growing up and um, Alabama and the Chicks and just uh, a lot of that 90s country. It was a big, big part of my um, upbringing for sure. Yeah, and do you, when you kind of write today or you're singing today, do you try and bring them influences into your music now with you? Because you say kind of using like the country pop vibes in the 90s, do you try and use that now? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I love, my favorite kind of country song is the one that sort of tells a story and you feel like you know the characters in it and there's kind of a an ebb and a flow to the song and I feel like I hope people can hear that in the songs that I write and so I always credit that part of my writing to that really heavy-handed 90s country that I was fed growing up and then as far as the way I'd like to dress it up I think it gets a little bit poppier in that arena like it has a lot of pop sensibility to it but I always feel like the foundation of it um, has a lot of country influence for sure. Yeah, I love that. And what about kind of, as you say, you started a band with your best friend and you kind of knew, right, this is potentially a career. Was there a point you look back at and you were like, oh, okay, I'm actually quite good at this. This could be something I pursue. Is there a moment in your life you think, oh, that was the moment that I knew this is what I was going to do or I was going to try and do? I don't know that there's a particular moment. Like, to be honest, I, I knew I wanted to do this probably when I was about 12 and I just didn't know, you know, growing up in, in a very small town in, in Alberta, Canada, I didn't know anybody who had had a career in music. And so it took me a couple of years to even figure out how and, and where you go <laughs> to even start something like this. So like, I'll try to, I feel like it was, I don't know that I can remember the exact moment, but like I said, I started this duo with my best friend and I think it might've been after we played one of our first shows and I was just so pumped to have played the show and, and just everything leading up to it, the rehearsals and, every, and advertising for it and everything. And so, you know, there's so much more to being a musician than that. So I was probably a little bit naive at the time, but I remember kind of in the wake of our first show, just being so keyed up and, and thinking, yeah, I, I could do this forever. I want to do this forever. So there's probably somewhere in there. I love that. And what about the writing aspect of it? Because you, you write all of your own songs and it's obviously something that is a big part of, of your career and, and you and music. Where did you kind of, did you learn to write or did it come quite naturally? When did that kind of come into the mix? Well, like I... Uh, mentioned I was in a, a duo with my really good friend and she had written more than I had at that point and so it was really her that kind of like I we would co-write all the time and it was kind of her that helped me sort of get over any kind of apprehension or fear that I had or maybe embarrassment about like I didn't really know what I was doing um, so I came to songwriting a little bit later but prior to that I was always really interested in creative writing and poetry and, and I read a lot. And so I've always really admired and appreciated literature in a lot of different forms. And so um, I found out right away that writing songs is such a great cathartic way to express yourself and a way to brand yourself as an artist and kind of set yourself apart because it's your perspective and it's, you know, no one can really affect it the way you can. Um, and so when I kind of figured it out and got comfortable with it, I, I really cherished it because it, it felt like, okay, this is sort of the ground floor of where you make yourself stand set apart from others kind of thing. And that was always something I understood that you needed to do as an artist. You needed to figure out what you were good at and kind of lean into it because it's just part of, of creating your, your image as an artist and, and expressing yourself. And so the writing became a really valuable tool for me when I figured out how to do it kind of. No, that's great. And obviously when you kind of, when it all tied together and you kind of knew, okay, this is the kind of vibe I'm going to go for, I'm going to write these songs. Um, was it a, did you have a plan on how you were going to pursue it as a career? I know you were kind of back and forth to Nashville, um, but did you have kind of a, like a, a five-year plan or anything like that? Or was it just kind of, let's see what happens? 
It was, I'd say a little bit of both. Um, I think a lot of people would say when you're a musician, like it's nice to have long-term goals, but it's also good to be a little bit open to pivoting because you never know what's what's going to happen right and so I had a bit of a you know Nashville was always on my mind it was always on my horizon and mostly because Nashville is kind of the the hub for where songwriters go you know and I really wanted to become a better writer I wanted to write with you know really amazing writers and learn from them so Nashville was definitely always on my mind and on the horizon I just didn't know how I was going to do it how I was going to get there and then thankfully I ended up more or less getting discovered on Twitter by Thomas Rhett's dad. And he, you know, a year or so after that signed me to a publishing deal. And so that was, that was kind of my in, that was my point of entry into Nashville. And I knew it had to look something like that just because being Canadian, you need um, like a work visa, I guess, to, to be able to work in the States and to get paid to do stuff. And so I couldn't just, pack up my stuff and move like I needed to be a little more um I had to have documents and everything else and so it really worked well in my favor to get the publishing deal and then move down and, and so yeah as far as my plan goes I don't know that I planned on that <laughs> it was pretty fluky but um yeah I like to think that you know it's nice to have hopes and and some expectations for yourself but it's also really good to just kind of go with the flow because you never know what's going to happen yeah and and as you say it, you'd never know um did you ever expect to be discovered on twitter <laughs> no i mean especially like if you know Rhett akins uh he doesn't really spend a lot of time on social media whatsoever let alone on twitter and so it was that just makes it even more bizarre to me that that's how it all happened um i i guess i initiated it i followed him on Twitter because Thomas Rhett, I'd just seen him play live and I was really impressed. So I followed TR first and then Twitter suggested more people to follow and Rhett Akins was one of them. And I I did not know it was TR's dad because they, they're billed slightly differently in their names. And I didn't know that that Rhett was such an amazing songwriter. He had you know all these Blake Shelton cuts and uh, Jason Aldean and all these things. And um, I really just kind of went with it. I his, his Twitter was verified. So I was like, I'm pretty sure it's, it's who it is. Like I'm not being catfished. And um, yeah, I, I never dreamed that that would be the way I would get discovered. And I, and I think on purpose, I tried not to dream of something that serendipitous because it you know, honestly, it's not lost on me that that doesn't happen very much. Like I'm very lucky that, that it happened that way. So yeah, you never know. Do you remember the first kind of message he sent you? I still have it actually. <laughs> it's still in my inbox and I, I forget exactly what it said but it was something like he he saw my name and then he went to my youtube channel because i think it was linked to my twitter at the time and i think he said something like hey um just saw your youtube channel i really liked your stuff and it was like if you're i think he knew i was in canada and he said if you're ever if you ever come to nashville i'd love to help you i think is what he said and so i i didn't know what that entailed and um it really wasn't long after that message that I was at his house in Nashville, just just getting to know him and talking about my goals. And um, he became just a wonderful champion and a wonderful role model and somebody I could just ask anything about the industry to. And so it's been a real blessing. Yeah. And how kind of looking back, you know, a lot of people say it's not what you know, it's who you know, et cetera. And I think particularly within like the music industry it's a lot of kind of you get contacts here and there how val valuable was it looking back having that kind of mentor and someone who could kind of be like do this don't do this or or was it like that was it a mentorship relationship it was incredibly valuable for sure because I I know that a lot of people you know are they hang out in Nashville for probably a couple of years before they find <clears throat> a really valuable resource like that um but yeah I mean he's been so supportive um just of what I want to do in my career you know like he's he's never been someone who's like you need to not do this you need to do that like he's not domineering whatsoever like he it's really lovely that he trusts my vision as an artist and so he kind of waits for me to come to him and, and ask you know his advice on certain things but um 
you know, and you will run into people in the industry who will tell you like, this is what you're doing wrong. And this is what you need to do. And this is how you need to change. But I think the people who trust you and can, you know, guide you gently instead of just sort of demanding that you do this and that, those are the people you need to keep around because you want people to, to call you on things and hold you accountable and, and challenge you where you need to be challenged. But the biggest part of, I think, being an artist these days is just figuring out who you are and figuring out how to let that shine. It's not really about changing who you are. And Rhett's never wanted to change me, which is so great. Yeah, I love that. And kind of going forward then through, through this process with, with signing with him and um, releasing your first EP, what was that like? Were you still going back and forth to Nashville? Had you moved there? Again, was there kind of a plan of what you were doing whilst you were recording? I, so my EP, the one I put out in 2018 is called Self Medicine. And that was very shortly after I'd moved to Nashville. And that was sort of already kind of in the works. Um, it was still technically like an independent album or an EP, sorry, that I put out. Um, but yeah, I'd been living in Nashville for about three months or so. And then it came out in January of 2018. And then um, I guess I'm trying to think what the timing would be. I ended up putting out California King, my next EP, that was in 2020. So um, yeah, I've been living there for a couple of years at that point. Yeah, and did you feel a shift in your writing or kind of the speed of, of the way you were doing things from moving to Nashville, from kind of being maybe on the outskirts of it, visiting every now and again, working with people to then being in, in the center of it, having kind of everything accessible. Did you notice a shift in, in kind of the way things went? Yeah, definitely. I think you can't help but see the palpable difference between because I, I feel like self-medicine, a lot of those songs were written over the years of me being in Canada and writing a lot of them myself, which I still like to do. But um, between that EP and the next, a lot of it was more, um, you know, collaborative. And it was also my tastes had changed because I'd been in Nashville and I was a little more plugged in what everybody was doing. And so I was probably more inspired by my peers and what they were doing as opposed to self-medicine, which was very much just kind of me um, doing whatever I wanted, which was great. Um, that's really just the difference between the two of them was I think um, the California King EP just showed my growth as an artist and as a collaborator and also just what my influences were at the time, which were probably a little more on the pop side of things, on the crossover country side of things. And so, yeah, it's always interesting to look back and see the differences. Mm -hmm. And have you ever felt, I mean, I, I think now there is always such a crossover with so many genres of music, particularly when you're kind of labeled as a country artist, you can go into so many different genres. Did you always kind of think, I want to be a country artist or was it, I'm gonna kind of live in Nashville, get the vibe of country music. This is what I know but I want to explore everything else. Did you have a kind of set in stone idea of what you wanted to be as an artist? I wouldn't say that. I think because I'm so influenced by so many different genres, I, I know that there's a there's kind of the bedrock of who I am as an artist will always come back to country music just because of how much it shaped me in the beginning of my life. But um, especially the last couple of years, and I feel like even through the pandemic, uh, genre has become such a secondary thing for people you know it's not so much a world where you turn on a, a genre radio like a rock radio station or a country radio station and you only listen to that like it's we're in such a playlist world now where it's just kind of like whatever you feel you might hear a country song and then the next song that plays will be pop and the next one that plays will be rap and so it's kind of just whatever people are feeling, which is such a great lane for me, I feel, because that's how I'm writing music lately, is kind of if one song has a bit more of a pop heavy influence and then another one is more country, it doesn't really bother me as much because I don't think it's as on people's minds as maybe it was at one time. And so, yeah, I I think I've gone through different reincarnations where I've, I've thought like, yeah, I'm definitely a country artist or I'm definitely a this or that artist and at this point I feel like I'm just an artist <laughs> you know like I'm just writing what I feel and, and hopefully the music that I make will find the audience that likes it and that's and that's such a great place to be and I think a lot of artists are in the same boat. Yeah and I think as well as you say kind of in such a playlist world actually your music gets out to so many more people and people yeah. 
you know, you wouldn't necessarily, as you say, turn on a country radio station, your song would pop mm-hmm. up on, you know, Apple Music or Spotify, and they're like, oh, actually, I really like this, whereas it would never have come up. Have you, have you noticed that? I think, actually, as well, like, being in the pandemic kind of really pushed that as well. Obviously, streaming services were a thing, but did you notice kind of throughout that period of probably kind of low time in that you weren't touring, etc., that you actually gained more fans and more listeners through a kind of quiet when you were when everything was online basically yeah i think so i partly for me i was one of the the few artists that actually um put out music i put out california king in april of 2020 which was like basically the the week after the whole world shut down <laughs> and um in some regards it was quiet but i also felt like you know that was kind of my my american debut and so I ended up through a lot of the pandemic doing press for that EP and it was, yeah, it was really interesting to see the kind of people that, that jumped on the project and that um, identified with it um, just because it was sort of me, it was my first real effort in a new territory. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was really cool to kind of connect with fans on that level where everything isn't so go, go, go. It was kind of put this project out, see what happens. And yeah, I definitely did see um, kind of an uptick in, my American followers and just people that are discovering you on playlists and through Spotify and things like that. So it was a kind of very interesting, but, but still cool, like period of, of growth for sure. Yeah, that's so great. And as you say, that was kind of the beginning of the pandemic. And then on the back end of that, uh, last year, kind of the summer of last year, you released your first full length album. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that. And um, particularly in, in, First of all, foremost, the title track, because I've heard, kind of seen you talk about this before, and I love why you chose that as the title track and kind of exploring that. So can you tell us a little bit about the story behind the song that eventually mm-hmm. became uh, Pinto, the album? Yeah, so the like like you said, the album's named after this this track called Pinto. And it's really all about this this old car from the 70s called the, the Ford Pinto that sort of gained this reputation for itself as being very hazardous and, and, and prone to exploding and catching on fire and things, just because of a fundamental flaw in the, the structure. And I was reading, I was in an antique shop in Franklin, Tennessee, and I found this old owner's manual for a Pinto. And I remembered the story of just how dangerous this car was and how it kind of became a bit of a laughing stock and kind of a cult classic. And upon kind of remembering all of that, I, I drew this comparison to young love and, and your first time uh, being in love with somebody and how it can be similar to that in that, you know, the emotions can feel very explosive at any given moment and the highs are really high and the lows, the heartbreak is really low. And, you know, it can be very exciting and exhilarating, but, but dangerous for your heart at the same time. And so I wrote this song about this young couple that actually rides around in a Ford Pinto and it's supposed to be a bit of a metaphor for their relationship. And I was, at the time, I was sort of, as a time of writing it, I didn't know what my next project was going to look like. And I was kind of struggling for the material and the subject matter and just how it could be a departure from my last project. And as I was writing the song, all of a sudden I heard, I had this sort of lightning rod of inspiration and I heard the, the synthesizers and I thought it'd be so cool to kind of merge country with the kind of 80s pop and a lot of those sounds. And the, this song just felt so appropriate because it's about kind of a vintage car. And um, yeah, all of a sudden I had this, this epiphany of what I wanted the whole album to sound like. And it was all sort of centered around Pinto. So I would take it into co-writes and I would play, play it for my co-writers and say, what, whatever we write today needs to point back to this because it's sort of the, the muse. And so then when it obviously came time to pick the single, I wanted it to be Pinto. And, and there was really never any doubt in my mind that the album would be called Pinto as well. Love that. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of the time um, you, you hear of people that will, will name an album and they will, it'll just be, you know, because that song on the record summed it up in a nutshell. But actually hearing that it was the first song you wrote and you built the album around that is a really mm. interesting thing to do. 
did you ever were that was there ever a point through that where you were like oh no I'm not feeling this I'm going to go in another direction or did it flow quite well from that initial idea it always flowed quite well and I feel really lucky that I that I wasn't plagued with doubt um at any point because I think that's really common and that's okay if that happens you know if you second guess yourself through it but um it was really kind of this this phenomenon for me that it just I was in the middle of writing the song and I just kind of had a vision of what the whole thing would be and I felt so strongly about it and was just so inspired and excited by it at every point that um you know I definitely wrote songs that I felt you know weren't right for the project but I felt I always felt really strongly that the project itself needed a life somewhere somehow and so uh, I'm just so grateful that it's out it was you know I wrote Pinto in 2018 <laughs> the album came out in 2022 um, because it was supposed to come out in 2020 and then pandemic happened and we just kind of wanted to wait for the opportune moment and it presented itself this past summer and so yeah there was thankfully for me there was never any doubt that's so great and I think actually it, it's come at a great time so you are kind of back out there as you say on radio tours you are coming over to the UK in a couple of weeks for a few shows um how is it being back out are you excited to kind of explore these new places and new shows what are you looking forward to um I'm very excited to come over to the UK I haven't been really ever to England I've been to Heathrow <laughs> that's it but um Last time I was ever over there, I went to Ireland and Scotland. And so I'm really excited to actually like set foot in London proper and uh, just really get to know the music scene over there because you guys have this this market for country music and fans that are really asking for it. And, you know, it's really cool to look at my uh, Spotify analytics and see, you know, routinely that the top three areas of the world that stream the best for me are Canada, the US and the UK. And so I kind of asked my team early last year, you know, I'm like, could we maybe try and do something and get over there just because I really want to start just getting my feet on the ground over there and making relationships and just, you know, forging that connection somewhat early on in my career because I want to be able to be an international artist. And, and I didn't know what would come of it, but here we are. It's, it's coming up really fast and we've got you know, a show in London and a show in Liverpool and we're doing some writing and we're gonna be around for the Americana week. And so uh, I couldn't be more excited. It's gonna be so great. And as you say, yeah, it's it's kind of, I do think the last few years it has grown massively, but there is so many country music fans here in particular. Um, and again, I think just in general music fans. So as we were talking about earlier that genre is not really a thing anymore you know someone will hear a good song or a good artist and they'll be like yeah I want to go to that I know I'm I'm one of them people um mm -hmm. but it's gonna be so great and I'm I'm sure it's gonna you know um it like to so many more opportunities um and things in the future um so we're gonna wrap up kind of shortly but I do ask three uh, everyone three questions at the end of every episode um I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit because they're all around threes <laughs> so um firstly my favorite songwriter question to ask can you name three songs that you wish you'd have written mm. Jolene by Dolly Parton uh it's a great one um <laughs> dancing queen by abba that's another great one and let's see for a third one uh maybe dreams by fleetwood mac i mean i'm i'm reaching for the classics here but they're they're classics for a reason they so are also they really are um what about three albums you couldn't live without Ooh, um, I mean, <laughs> I'm actually on the, I'm still on the Midnight's Taylor Swift album train, like really hard. Mm -hmm. I know it came out in October, um, but as far as like her whole body of work, I think 1989 would be the album of hers that I can't live without. Such a, such an amazing record. Um, I'm trying to think, I just have so many, it would be so <laughs> hard. <laughs> The Continuum album by John Mayer, that's a really great record. Um, and yeah, I should, I'm trying to think of a country, of a country album also we could put on there. Um, I'll say 
one that I rode into the ground was oh I have I'll say it's a tie uh 21 by Adele yeah one. but also um the the fly album by the chicks that's a really good one yeah. too that's a great one. That's a really great one, actually. Um, Continuum is probably, we've been doing this for nearly three years, and that is definitely by far the album that has said the most. So if there oh, was I... a survey, it would be that that is the greatest album that people can't live without. It's just such a great body of work, for sure. And I think it kind of changed the direction music was going. And so, yeah, I think between it just being so good and so influential, I, yeah, I feel like a ton of people would, would list that one for sure. Yeah, it really is. Um, what about three, so three people, they can be artists or writers, producers, whomever, that you haven't yet had a chance to work with that are kind of bucket list people for you to work with in the future? Um, I would, I haven't met Keith Urban yet. I'm a huge Keith Urban fan. And I would love to, if not, meet him just like uh to I would love to just meet him but I would also love to collaborate and do do a song um I think I think our our sound would would do well together so that's a big one um I I'm also a huge Lana Del Rey fan and I like I, I almost hesitate to mention her because I'm like could I collaborate with her or would I just like melt into a puddle <laughs> just <laughs> one girl just stay there and <laughs> like I I could breathe around her, let alone try to write a song. But yeah, we'll say Lana and uh, who else? I mean, uh, Ellie Golding would be awesome. I think we could write a cool tune as well. Right. You just try and find her when you're in London. She's yeah. in the studio at the moment. I've seen the Instagram. <laughs> yeah. But no, that is great. I love that. <laughs> um so that's kind of the end of, of my side of questions but there is kind of one thing that I, I love to know so you, obviously you're touring at the moment and you're going to be over here and you've just released your album but kind of in the future 2023 we're at the beginning of the year what is to come from you this year what can you tell us about what we can expect yeah I'm going to be playing some more shows hopefully we're just we're booking them all the time um I'm also kind of halfway done my next record and so Hopefully we're gonna start rolling that out. Uh, we're not really sure when, but sometime this year. Um, and yeah, I really just, I'm, I'm kind of, through the pandemic, you kind of get backlogged with all these songs. And so I have a lot of stuff that I wanna get out and and hopefully I'm gonna be making more trips. I, I really don't want this to be my only trip to the UK this year. I want to come back. And so maybe we'll come back a second or third time, God willing. And um, yeah, I really just wanna keep playing shows now that we can and just um, keep putting out music, keep connecting. Definitely. And I think, as you say, it's it's all about kind of just getting back out there again. Um, I know there's mm -hmm. a lot of people excited to hear new music from you and to get to your shows. Um, and I'm sure hopefully after this episode, there'll be even more people lined up ready to listen. So thank you so, so much for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure um, and look forward to seeing you at your show in a few weeks time. For sure. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.